All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for taking some time out this afternoon. Uh, this is JAMF, How to Reprovision iOS Devices. Okay. Presenting today, you've got myself. Uh, my name is Stacy. I'm a Senior Enterprise Customer Success Manager here at JAMF. And I am Zach. I am a Senior Enterprise Support Engineer. So, uh, between me and Stacy, we've got about a decade of experience with seeing uh, provisions go well and not so well. So we're, we're here to talk about it. Today's agenda, uh, what we're going to be taking a look at is just sort of a 30,000 foot overview of making our environments ready for the new school year. Um, definitely not a very detailed playbook uh, as every environment is unique and uh, we want you to uh, inspire you to have those conversations with your customer success managers and those that you talk to here at JAMF. Um, yeah, this is uh, not not a step-by-step -step guide because everybody, like Stacy said, every environment's different. Everybody has different needs, different requirements, different problems to solve. So we can't provide all of those in half hour. <laughs> those are uh, much longer conversations. So where we want to go here is to empower you to get those conversations started. Definitely. So today we'll be taking a look at where to begin. Uh, we'll stop off at doing some upgrades and app deployment, uh, and then a discussion on enrollment methods. Uh, at the very end, we have uh, an announcement about our online training catalog. Uh, and then we'll take some, some Q&A as uh, time permits. So taking a look at uh, where to get started. Uh, my friend Zach here coined an amazing phrase that I'll share with you. Uh, it all starts where last year ended. Uh, and that's definitely what we want to take a look at first. Right. You know, the, the best best way to get started on your deployment is making sure that this year wraps up well. So kind of where we want to start here is by talking about, you know, what you've been doing and how that's going to look different next year a little bit. So our different deployment methods, there are several. We get a one-to-one -one device relationship where each, each student gets their own device, can be theirs to care for for a year or two years, four years. You know, everybody does it a little bit differently, but either way, that direct one-to-one -one relationship between the student and the device. We also have the one-to-many approach where you'll have devices, maybe cart-based, where a kid grabs, grabs a device each time a class starts or sorts them that way. And then there's also the shared deployment model, which is basically the same as the one-to-many, but utilizes Apple School Manager, utilizes managed Apple IDs, and gives a, an opportunity for a kid to have closer to a one-to-one -one relationship with the device, except that it might be a different device every day. So the, the managed Apple IDs allow them to sign in, get their apps and their data that might be saved up to the cloud. Sure. And after taking a look at how we're doing it this year, the next thing we would like to uh, recommend that we jot down in our notebook is, what is next year going to look like? Are we changing our deployment method any? Uh, what type of things do we need to get ready if we are going to change how we're deploying? Uh, things like prep work. Do we need to get a list of users put together uh, so that we can get those assigned to our devices? Do we have enough devices on hand if we're switching to a one-to-one -one model? Um, and then basically, how are we going to enroll them? Uh, we want to make sure that we have a, a smooth transition if we are switching to, let's say, for example, a one-to-one -one model. How do we want that deployment method to look? So, you know, a big, big part of that is where are the devices, right? Like it seems like a simple question, but sometimes that can be half the battle. You know, do you have devices that are going home with students? Do you keep them on carts? Are teachers taking care of them? Do you have IT staff that's going to be collecting them all, putting them in a box, putting them in a closet all summer? So those, those are things that we need to think about because they can dramatically impact the steps we need to take to have a smooth deployment at the end of the year, or at the beginning of the next year. Um, activation lock is one one giant red flag in particular. If you have one to one or you know even a single school year one to one where a device gets signed into by an Apple ID, by kids able to enable activation lock if they are not signing out of that Apple ID 
we're going to need to rely on a MDF, uh, an activation lock code clearance, which can be a fraught process. It does not always go smoothly, and hopefully we can take steps to avoid that entire headache. And one of the last things that we want to take a look at then when we are getting ready for the next year is are we adding new devices into our environment? Uh, why this is important is we're looking to make sure, again, have we done enough prep work ahead of time? Are our new devices going to need to be put into cases? Do they, are they going to need to have firmware for the keyboards and things like that done uh, ahead of time? Uh, are we going to need any new storage, places to put these devices? Uh, anything like that that we can do ahead of time uh, will definitely increase or uh, make better our chances for having a smooth deployment. A step in time saves nine, right? <laughs> All right. So the next thing we want to take a look at then is just deploying apps uh, and uh, different versions of iOS. And the first place we want to talk about there, or first thing we want to talk about then is let's talk about scale. So with scale, I mean just talking about the size of your deployment and what we can do to plan around that. If you have 100 devices to move with one app per device, you've probably got a pretty easy deployment ahead of you. When that count goes up to 30,000 devices with 20 apps each, we need to start taking an entirely different approach. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the things that go into that scale and what it means and what happens as it grows. So the starting point there would be the VPP monitor. To get into that a little bit and what that means before we get into it, uh, VPP is the Volume Purchase Program. Apple's got a new name for it. Yes, it's just Volume Purchasing now. Just Volume Purchasing. And I need to get with the times and change my lingo, but I'm a little slow on that. Uh, it's what we use to deploy licenses to devices so that students can download apps without being prompted for an Apple ID. So, huge, hugely beneficial program, also time consuming. You know, it takes time to do things. And when we start talking about large scales, we start talking about greater lengths of time that we need to plan for. I was doing some, some looking on you know, how the process actually works, you know, threading and all of that stuff that nobody really cares about. But when you wanna think about timing, Look at it this way, it breaks down. If you need to deploy 600,000 licenses, and you know that can be one app to 600,000 devices, which is unlikely. But you know, if you run the math a different way, that starts to look a lot more realistic. You know, 600,000 devices could take theoretically 12, 15 hours to process out. So if you've got a lot of apps that need to go to a lot of devices very quickly, it's probably not going to work out the way you want unless you take some of this stuff into consideration. And it's also definitely worth mentioning here, um, this VPP process uh, can definitely go a lot faster depending on what time of year we're doing this. Uh, if we're doing the testing of this uh, during the slow seasons, uh, maybe around Christmas or even right now, uh, those licenses and apps are going to deploy out to those iPads a lot faster than they are, say, around the time we're going to be doing our enrollments later. Um, definitely keep that in mind when coming up with a strategy for deploying our devices and pushing out apps to those devices um, that you and every other school in the nation is also doing the same thing. So uh, the process will definitely slow down a bit. Yep, getting a jump start on that if we talk about ways to get ahead of it, that's hugely beneficial. So DEP Monitor would be our next stop, uh, the Device Enrollment Program, which I believe is now referred to as Apple's Apple. Device Enrollment. Or, yeah, something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, I, again, not keeping up with the times. So <laughs> this is a back-end system that allows Apple to be assured that your organization is yeah. a device and that you can have greater functionality and control over the device as you know, as an organization that definitely owns it. Apple is very centered on personally owned devices. That's a uh, high priority for them. So DP helps us get devices into a supervised state, helps us set up devices fresh out of the box. Super awesome. Not everybody has it, but it's the way of the future. 
definitely look into it as you can. One of the things that I wanted to touch on for this is we've made some significant changes to the way it works with Jamf Pro recently. So as of Jamf Pro 10, 11, 1 and later, so I don't foresee a lot of new changes coming between now and the time you'll be rolling out devices. What we're doing instead of having a refresh button, we used to have that in the pre-stages, a lot of workflows centered around that. You'd assign devices to a pre-stage and then you'd hit refresh to make sure they all just popped right in where they were supposed to be. Something we discovered was that when people do that, hitting that manual refresh, it can interrupt the automated processes that were happening and could cause devices to get kind of lost in transition. So previously our DEP monitor ran once per hour and that was definitely not fast enough for most environments, thus the refresh button. What we've done now is remove the refresh button and shorten that time to every five minutes. So it can take up to 10 minutes for new assignments to appear because you could make your assignment, the monitor runs once, reports it to Apple, Apple confirms it, but doesn't update it with Jamf Pro until the next monitor run after that. So as long as you're aware of that, it's pretty easy to plan for. There's plenty of other things you can do in Jamf Pro while you wait that five to 10 minutes, but nothing's wrong. Excellent. The next bullet point on here is the, the overall MDM process. Uh, understanding this uh, will definitely help uh, not only with troubleshooting should we run into issues pushing out apps, uh, and enrolling, um, but just understanding how the overall communication of your devices uh, work, not only with Apple, but with Jamf. Uh, internally here, we, we refer to it as the triangle or Dorito, if you were. Um, basically, the, the quick and easy version of how this process works is uh, you have <clears throat> a MDM command of some kind that goes out from the Jamf server that gets sent up to Apple in queues so that uh, the next time the device checks into Apple, it knows that it needs to go over to Jamf Pro uh, to, to get whatever it is, configuration profile, uh, commands for downloading uh, a new application and anything along that line. So it just forms a nice communication between Jamf Pro server to Apple, device to Apple, and then device over to Jamf Pro. Uh, if you're looking for a really great resource on this, there is a 2018 JNUF video on this. It is called the Push Odyssey. Definitely worth uh, 40 minutes of your time to take a look, especially if uh, we are looking for the words to explain this adequately to our network team. Um, Zach's got a few comments, though, about uh, how the app communication works. Yeah, so the, the important thing about that triangle and why we need to be concerned with the triangle is Understanding that it's not just as simple as hitting install application in Jamf Pro and Jamf Pro sends a command to the device. It's not that direct. There's, there's a triangle, there's more paths of communication, and there's more than one thing that happens there. When you deploy, uh, say you scope out an application to a device, the application needs to talk to Jamf Pro, realize it should have that app, and it needs to talk to the MDM triangle to get the instruction to download it, needs to go out to the iTunes store and or the App Store, pull that app down, then report back to Jamf Pro through a separate MDM command, uh, an application list, and let it know, hey, here's the new updated list of applications I have. I don't think I need anything else. Jamf Pro reviews it, looks at its scope, and says, hey, you know what? You've got everything you need. Have a great day. So the more apps we push, the more profiles we push, especially if we're trying to get it all done in the first day of school, can create just a massive amount of communication. And that's not inherently bad, as long as we know we can handle it. And part of this, you know, goes back to the scale and it goes back to the infrastructure. You know, can your network deal with moving that many apps? You may have the fastest Jam Pro server in the world, but if you've got a you know, low-end DSL line, you're still going to be very limited. And it's definitely worth re-mentioning here again uh, that this process tends to speed up and slow down the closer we get to uh, you know, the new school year. Um, a billion devices floating around there, uh, out there in the world, and they are all trying to provision just like you are uh, pretty much around the same time. So that network does tend to slow down a bit. It certainly does. 
So the final step here and kind of what we've been building up to is uh, Stacy's wonderful phrase of talking about chunking. By chunking, I mean breaking it up, doing it in batches. You know, grade one, day one, grade two, day two, school A, week one, school B, week two. We've seen a lot of different enrollments over the years, and the ones that have been closest to picture perfect, super smooth, couldn't have gone better, are the ones that will start a little early, you know, that, that week before school starts. Get it started, bringing in batches of students, here's your device, let's set it up, let's get some apps on it, and giving time for the whole process to work before pulling in all the rest of your devices. So doing it in chunks, breaking it up, giving it some time, which is a very hard thing to do at the beginning of school, right? We've got a lot of things that need to be happening all at once. So planning ahead is the golden ticket there. Absolutely. So I'd like to actually take a look then at some background Jamf Pro processes for doing updates and upgrades. One of the big um, hot buttons, so to speak, is auto app updates. Um, this is one of those things that is, we get asked a lot, can we do this? Can we activate this? Do we need to turn it off? Do we need to turn it back on? Uh, the unfortunate simple answer is this is very environmentally specific. Uh, and we'll want to take a look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. So again, definitely engage your customer success manager uh, to, to have this greater conversation. Um, but enabling this does come with a little bit of a cost. And again, I'll defer to Zach to explain what I mean by that. Right. And, and this is something that if you've been using Jamf Pro for a couple of years, you've probably had some issues off and on with iOS updates, or I'm sorry, automatic app updates. Sometimes they work very well. Sometimes, perhaps at the beginning of the school year, when there's a lot going on, they don't work so well. And that's because, like Stacy said, they come with a cost. So again, with Jamf Pro 1011, we took another swing at it, made some more changes. Uh, what we found was we were, we were trying to do the update of the app record from Apple. At the same time, we were trying to push out to all the devices that it was time to update the app. So one of the things we've done is we've broken that into two different checkboxes, one to check with Apple and see if there are updates, the other one to actually take an action upon those updates if needed. We've also changed the cycle so that those, those update your app commands aren't issued as soon as the app record in Jam Pro is updated. Those wait until the devices start checking in and updating their inventory so they do a version check. They say, hey, I've got you know, version 10. I see Jamf Pro says I should have version 11. Jamf Pro, kindly give me a command to install the new version of the app. So should smooth things out quite a bit. We've seen some excellent, excellent results, but it still comes back to cost. Automatic app updates are fantastic, but they cost something. They cost CPU cycles. They cost network bandwidth. So if you've got a desire to update all of your apps all the time, maybe maybe rethink how completely necessary that is. So Absolutely. Just use with some, not necessarily caution, but an understanding of the amount of traffic it can generate. Next one we have on here is the pushing of an iOS update. Uh, with this here, uh, we have some questions that we like to ask our, our clients when they call in. Uh, and it really is, what's the state of the device? Have they been sitting in a, a box for a really long time? Do we have a whole bunch of devices out there in our environment that are on uh, many different versions? Uh, knowing this is how we're going to determine how we handle updates. It's not going to be just as simple as pushing that MDM command to update uh, iOS across the board. Uh, we want to make sure that we are creating an environment where um, when we go to push out an update uh, or we have maybe our students or teachers uh, do that update, we want to make sure that it's going to be smooth. And to do that, we need to have all the devices basically about as close to being the same as we can uh, if we are going to push something in mass. Uh, otherwise, we're looking at a more manual process. 
And one thing to keep in mind here too is the way that the MDM, MDM command to update iOS works is very dependent on whether or not devices have a passcode. If they have a passcode, they're, they're assumed to be in the hands of someone who doesn't want things just magically happening on their device without their permission, basically. So if there's a passcode and you tell a device to download and install the update, it will do the download, but it won't actually execute that automated update without the user entering their passcode. So this is, this is a common thing that we run into a lot, and it's not something that we're able to override. So passcodes should be used. iOS should be updated. Right. So finding, finding a balanced middle ground there, you know, letting kids know this is what's happening. Put those iOS updates on your device when they come through. Scheduling it, timing it, that can be a little trickier, but something to keep in mind, certainly. Their next bullet point, you're probably asking, I thought this was about iOS. Um, imaging is definitely a Mac OS thing. And it's worth mentioning, uh, if we have Mac OS in our environment, uh, there are some things that we are going to want to consider uh, when it comes to our iOS devices. So where this ties in is the fact that imaging is, for all intents and purposes, quite dead. If you had you know, 10,000 Mac devices in your environment that you imaged last year, you're probably going to be doing something different this year, and it's probably going to involve a lot of network traffic and a lot of MDM traffic. So while that may not be, have been part of your calculation last year when you were thinking about all the different apps you needed to move to iOS, it should be considered this year. If you need to move twice that number to Mac OS and they're going to be bigger, that's something to think about. And when it comes to our Jamf Pro infrastructure, uh, for those of us on the call that are have an on-premise Jamf Pro instance, uh, the best advice we can give you here is upgrade early and often. <laughs> so uh, the other piece of advice that would go with that is minimizing points of failure. One of the requests I commonly get here is uh, somebody will say, hey, can you get on a call with me? We want to upgrade my SQL want to upgrade Java, and we want to upgrade Jamf Pro all at once. I don't particularly think that's the best way to go about it because you're introducing three potential points of failure, and when you fire up that server after finishing all three of those things at once and nothing works, it's going to be a lot harder to figure out what went wrong. So if you need to upgrade MySQL, please do it, and then make sure everything works, and then move to Java, and so on and so forth. Excellent. Well, then one of our final topics then for today is discussing the various different enrollment methods that we have available to us. Uh, so right off the bat, we have Apple's device enrollment. Uh, this is a great way to uh, allow all of our admins to kind of push the enrollment process off onto a larger group that doesn't necessarily have to be the IT team, whether it be students or teachers. Right. This is fairly simple for even the youngest kids to get through. Um, it involves some basic typing of a username. Generally, you know, we'll see people create managed Apple IDs that can be used, things like that. The, the automated device enrollment is also fantastic for fresh out of the box devices. You can have a kid unbox a device. They love that stuff. Absolutely, and one of the pros here also is uh, if we have uh, faculty or something like that off-site, they don't necessarily need to be on-site to enroll the device when we're utilizing Apple device enrollment. The next one is, is user-initiated enrollment. It's something that uh, you'll hear us probably refer to as over the air. Um, again, this is one of those things where we can have a certain level of students uh, is able to, to handle this enrollment method. Uh, the nice thing about this particular one is we don't need to have APNS in place for this to work. Right. We also don't need wiped devices like the automated enrollment required. So if we have devices that live with students year-round, we don't want to wipe that thing in August or September, October. We can, you know, we can keep them running just as they were, or we can run them through a fresh enrollment just to make sure that that MDM profile is refreshed and renewed 
uh, eliminates some points of failure that we can see throughout the year with certificates going stagnant and that sort of thing. And then our last one that we have available to us is the Apple Configurator. Uh, Zach and I tried to put our, our heads together for really good use cases for this one. Uh, and we both agree that basically this is great for those of us that are still utilizing carts. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic to be able to hook up, I think, what, 32 or 64 devices to a single USB hub and just boom, you can set them up all the same way, follow all the same blueprints. There's quite a bit you can lay down from the word go with Configurator. So it's, it's very handy for, for a cart-based approach. In our planning for enrollment methods, it's definitely worth mentioning that if we are looking to utilize features that require the device to be supervised, uh, we definitely want to take advantage of Apple device enrollment or Apple configurator. Right. That's one of the downsides of the user-initiated enrollment approach is it's unable to supervise devices. If they're already supervised, cool. But if they're not, it's not going to be able to put them in that state. Absolutely. The last thing we want to talk about when it comes to uh, enrolling devices uh, is really who's doing the work. Uh, and just some simple thoughts then on each one of those that you see on the screen. Yep. Uh, you know, with schools, there's, there's a wide variety out there. We have IT staff of hundreds or of zero, where, where it's the librarian or the person that, that has an iPad that becomes the IT staff. So flexibility there planning, looking at the number of boots you can put on the ground. Uh, yeah, definitely worthwhile. And that last one there, uh, if you think that maybe we, we don't have enough uh, hands on deck to handle a project for, uh, like maybe we're enrolling a thousand more devices than we did last year, uh, definitely the shameless plug there for uh, getting additional help from Jamf Professional Services. Uh, we are more than happy to come out and, and help in any uh, capacity that we are able to. And then finally, we just have some other things that we would like everybody to take into consideration when we're coming up with our overall game plan for uh, reprovisioning iOS devices. Uh, troubleshooting help. How can we help out uh, our support team when we call into Jamf? Uh, one of the best things you can do uh, when things aren't going as well as you'd like is you know, take out your Mac, go ahead and plug one of those iOS devices that is experiencing an issue, plug that into your Mac, and then open up console. You'll be able to pull a log off of that iOS device. Uh, and that's definitely you know, helpful for us when we are we're trying to help you out. Absolutely. So the, the tried and true the response to everything is get logs, but it's that way for a reason. You know, logs Logs can tell us a whole lot of things that we can't find out any other way. Along with the devices logs itself, the Jamf software server .log file, which is also available in the Jamf Pro GUI for hosted customers from the Jamf Pro information section. Those logs uh, tell us a lot more than a console log usually can when it comes to problems with volume purchase program or the device enrollment program. So that, that communication is all logged, and if there's something going wrong, we can usually find it in there. Absolutely. And then other things to think about, things like asset management, not hanging on to those iPads until they become really uh, expensive paperweights. Uh, there are companies out there that will definitely help you work through um, being able to more or less uh, swap those devices out and still get some credit out of them and then be able to deploy brand new uh, devices into the environment. Uh, are we gonna be adding cases that we didn't have last year? That's definitely something that is a large time consumer uh, that we might not be thinking about otherwise. Yep, new carts. This can take a little while to put together if they don't come that way out of the box. So another big thing to keep in mind is what is your network team up to this summer? Uh, we often often ask the question here, what changed? And a lot of times the response is, well, nothing. And that's, that's simply because we don't know that the network team replaced all the access points or replaced a switch. And you know, the, the second part that always comes out of that is, well, they set it up the same, so nothing really changed. But often, you know, different hardware, different manufacturers, different settings 
everything is flexible there, and the the smallest changes can cause the largest problems. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, that is what we have for you this afternoon. We definitely want to thank everybody for taking their time out to sit with Zach and myself. Uh, and I wish everybody a very successful summer rollout. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, everybody.